So I, I definitely think they'll start partnering mm -hmm. soon. And, yeah. I'm, I'm also very worried about once regulators start working with these firms and what's going to happen in terms of their ability to kind of know about the... Oh, I mean, they already know. <laughs> well, no, they, I mean, they, they, they can't know to the same degree, at least, in, or with the same ease. Like, you, even if you don't get a warrant, there's still red tape and there's time that goes through requesting, yeah. you know, customer data from Apple or from Google or for something. If, if it's on a public blockchain and you have tools yeah tools so they have like unlimited time <laughs> because it's not like it's going to get erased or anything not like grand where every six months it gets truncated uh so yeah i, I think again uh, with this kind of thing I, and again i don't think bitcoin's going anywhere uh other than to the moon right um but <laughs> No, I mean, you know, again, I think Grin, Mimblewimble, whatever implementation of this stuff, it's just, again, it's a step in the right direction um, as far as, like, how we as humans will start adopting to this kind of digital currency, you know, that isn't WeChat Pay where, you know, and the problem with WeChat Pay, and, and I hope this doesn't get broadcasted in China, but the problem with WeChat Pay is that, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a citizen of America, I'm afraid that if I store $10,000 US in my WeChat account, I... It's gone, you know. I have absolutely nothing I can do. I can't even prove that it was in there. Like, I take a screenshot, like you know. I mean, what can I do to actually prove that that money's there? It, there's nothing I can do. But you know, with something like Grin or Bitcoin or something like that, you know, that's that's mine, and no one can take that away from me uh, unless I put it in an exchange. <laughs> or you lose a private key. Or I lose a private key because, but that's my fault. You know, it's not like it was sure, yeah. maliciously caused by some centralized place. And, and we're talking about something that's really important, money, right? And what is money, right? It, it's 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 really just the ability to do things. It, it's so. What yeah. do you feel like are, are ideal properties of money? Oh man, right? There's this this has been talked about so many times, right? Yeah. Like it needs to be fungible. Uh, I forget all the lists. Right? What, what do you What do you think? Me personally, yeah. what is money? Well, um, no. What are ideal properties? Of money? Ideal properties of money. Uh, well, it it needs to be transportable. Right. Uh, you, I mean, although, you know, I think they had talked about like, the, it wasn't Easter Island, but it was something where like they just pointed at rocks and everyone knew what, who owned that thing. Uh, but, you know, ideal is like it's, trans, it's transferable, it's fungible, um, there is a limited supply, uh, and uh, I forgot what the other ones are, but yeah, uh, obviously now I believe in being the ability to have some sort of privacy <laughs> yeah. attached to it, yeah. But that wasn't actually one of the uh, main tenants. Yeah, yeah. and I, I would say privacy is basically synonymous with fungibility uh, because if it's not private and the asset could be seized by a government or another actor, then it's it's not meaningfully fungible. Yeah, and, and Bitcoin is slowly becoming non-fungible. Um, it's always been non-fungible. Well, yeah, it's because of the fact that like more I'm more, yeah. I'm four hops away from ISIS. Like this money that someone sent to me as a payment. Like I, I mean, how the hell would I know? I, I don't personally have a red flag, but now I try to it, it, turn it into an exchange. And they're like, you can't, you know, you just get locked up or something. I mean, that's totally possible in a dystopian future, not too far away. So. Yeah, I mean, I I, I don't I don't necessarily think it's dystopian if private entities like exchanges say that if you've interacted with ISIS unknowingly. Oh yeah, but then if they take the Bitcoin and they can give it back to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how the hell was I supposed to know, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that's like 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 saying that Tim Draper's Bitcoin is all tainted because uh, I guess Tim Draper er, yeah. bought a lot of the bought the uh, uh, so the Silk Road was it used to be like the largest drug market. The FBI took it down, seized all the Bitcoin, and then auctioned off the Bitcoin. Tim Draper is the guy who bought all that Bitcoin. Yep. So he bought what is essentially tainted Bitcoin. So I mean, that, that, that like begs the question of if all the projects he funded with Bitcoin, are they going to be like called out by the FBI in a few years? But I mean, that's another story. But I think like one property of money that we're, we're is sort of overlooking is the governance of it. Yeah. So I think what, what crypto introduced, which is really interesting, is decentralized governance. So the idea of using game theory and economics to create new ways of how money should function in society. And it's like, it, through crypto, like it, through like, uh, like proof of stake, like having the people are able to have a, a say in what is the future of that currency. Which is like right now with the dollar is basically the, the Fed just tells us what's going to happen. And we, and we have to say okay like with, with, with no, no contest. I mean, the idea of having the people like come together, and it's it's interesting though also how it's explored in different ways. Like we've seen 
in, I mean, probably hundreds of different types of consensus models of how, how do we structure these groups of people who has a larger say, should it be on how much money they have, should it be every, every person has an equal say. I mean, I think that's uh, something really compelling that cryptocurrency has have opened up for us. For sure, yeah. I think the, the last property that I feel like is important to me that you both have touched on is inflationary deflationary. I think by just the questions I've asked and that I'm investing in Beam and not Grin, I think deflationary is a, an ideal property of money. Mm -hmm. I think it incentivizes saving versus incentivizes spending. Um, and then there's also, it's like, who's inflating the monetary supply? So at least with something like Ethereum or Grin, the inflation is known, there can't be tampered with, but when you rock the Federal Reserve, uh, inflation is done you know, by, without really any major accountability. And it's done not for inflating the total monetary supply, but it's it's really a tax on those who kind of receive the money last. Mm -hmm. So it, it benefits, like all kind of counterfeit money, it benefits like the banks uh, that they give the money to and the government first, mm -hmm. uh, but then kind of everyone as a, as a whole loses, but there's some actors that gain and some that lose basically whoever interacts with the monetary supply first before prices uh, catch up to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one like how you talked about how the Fed uh, sort of adjusts interest rates. I think uh, an interesting additive of that is uh, is like crypto backed loans, like models like Maker, where you can put up crypto to get get a loan, and it's it's really the the percentage of how much collateral you need versus how much you get. It's all up to a, a new design in a way. So instead of having like all these mortgage brokers who who can only give you an interest like a certain X percentage. You can shop around to a lot of different places and really see what people have to offer. I remember back in I think 2015, I was actually lending out uh, BTC on Poloniex to, to for people to margin trade with. That's an interesting model, although it wasn't profitable. But uh, like current models like Maker and part, generally participating in in these unique systems can can be profitable. And it's a, I mean it's a new mechanism to to have more money essentially. Yep. It's uh. I think the best MakerDAO, uh, and I'm so interested in MakerDAO because I, I think a, a private stable token is quite interesting. Uh, but the best one I saw was like, okay, you, I got to loan money to myself. <laughs> what does that all mean? And uh, apparently with MakerDAO, like, you need to only take out 60% of whatever your collateral is or else you're going to watch your asset just get nuked. <laughs> well, it, it depends. Like yeah. Volatility. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's like okay. you want to you want to keep a safe margin, or it's just like you might as well just sold it on the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> and, and also putting up 150 percent collateral is pretty yeah. steep. Yeah. yeah. Sixty. Six, you can only take out 60 yeah. percent, right? So it's, like, it's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Right? So yeah, uh, unless you think we're gonna hit a big bull bull market soon. <laughs> yeah. So. So, I think at this time I'd like to take some questions from the audience. Uh, just raise your hand and. Uh, Get it started. Not everybody at once. <laughs> hey, Mark. Could you elaborate a little bit more on why you think that uh, deflationary currencies are better? Because I think if more people save, then there's less liquidity in the market and less funding, and the economy will grow on a slower pace. Yeah, so I, I actually think that's. Uh, oh, maybe that's what you want. Yeah, so f first off, I want to say we haven't really ever seen this because all money has always been diluted in some way when we've had gold or silver you can always mine more and then over the last like hundred years most of the ways we store value is in government fiat currency which is always inflated or goes to zero because the government uh, goes away so I don't think we've ever meaningfully seen what like a deflationary economy would look like in the modern world over the long run my I don't feel very strongly that if we were to switch to, let's say, instead of targeting 2% inflation now, 2% deflation, it will 100% be better in the US. Uh, but I do feel like it will likely be better than what we have now. And I think a, a big reason for that for me is like is climate change and overconsumption. Right now by spending and having unstoppable or kind of perpetual economic growth that I think is not just productivity, but is also due to inflation, uh, you're going to get uh, more incentive to fly, more incentive to build, more incentive to do things that I think some people would say is just all good, but I think like comes at a cost. And I think uh, it's definitely worse for the economy in the sense that there's less economic growth, less liquidity in the market, but I think it's perhaps better for human organization and, and quality of life. 
Uh, but most importantly, the way that I want to experiment with that is not saying you have a government fiat currency where the Federal Reserve now targets 2% deflation. It's more we're introducing deflationary assets like Bitcoin or Beam into the market and then seeing what that does for some people before making kind of wide swaths around like now everyone uses deflationary money. Um, yeah, so on the last one, I think it's good just to have the switch and toggle because like you said, it's all been inflationary. Now we can be inflationary, which is nice. Um, but I'm curious about, so uh, I think both Nimble Wimble implementations use uh, proof of stake, or sorry, they use um, proof of work, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, so that's what's used by Bitcoin, it's kind of the most proven in a way. Um, you know, just, I guess it hasn't broken, if that makes sense. Um, are, from your perspective, is, are there any other alternatives to the consensus? Um, that are also viable for like new or other you know, things on top of that. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not that all too familiar with the uh, different and uh, like sort of mining algorithms, but I know like, uh, like I'm very familiar with Filecoin, which uses like proof of replicability and um, proof of. I think time, I want to say. But, I mean, there, so there's a lot of d different ones of these. I'm uh, personally, I'm more of a fan of proof of stake over proof of work, just because I believe the energy consumption, it doesn't need to be there. Um, but I, I think proof of work is the right fit for, for Grin and for Mimble in general. I think um, maybe S Steve could, could have uh, more on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, a disclaimer: I am a EOS maximalist, <laughs> uh, which is weird, but. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but that's uh, it's a long story. But uh, yeah, I think proof of stake again uh, really requires a heavy-handed kind of uh, like it's almost like proof of stake needs, in my opinion, at least delegated proof of stake needs kind of a centralized uh, governance to it in in the sense that now we're kind of having more of like a U.S. Congress kind of thing where we kind of vote in the people and. All this kind of thing. Oh, well, someone needs to organize all these things happening. Proof of work, you just turn on a computer and it just happens. Uh, and I, I think everything is an experiment. You know, uh, I don't think that anything has been proven or not. But with Bitcoin, you know, having its 10-year anniversary recently, and it's sort of still decentralized. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, uh, unless like all of the uh, Chinese miners decide one day to just rewrite everything. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I think that would be the end of Bitcoin if that happened. But um, yeah, uh, I think uh, I think at least for now, you know, to just make everything easy, they just prove, uh, they just use proof of work. Uh, I I don't think that anyone's organized enough to try a proof of stake. Uh, at least like especially from the Grin team where there's no team. <laughs> yeah, so like I mean at that point like well who's going to be first? <laughs> yeah. I, I think that like Grin using proof of stake would be really interesting because I, I from what I've seen right now proof of stake tends to get abused a lot. Like for for instance Tron there's 27 like super representatives and I, I did some research on it and verified that at least 12 of them are personally controlled by Justin Sun. So it's not decentralized governance at all. Um, so it's like like having a decentralized entity like Grin do a, a proof of stake system that's actually fair would be really interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, to your point on proof of work versus other things, I think you said it that proof of work is the only thing that hasn't really broken. Uh, it all depends on the sliding scale of what broken is. Like some people might say there have been 51% attacks, therefore it has been broken. Uh, I would take kind of a more holistic view of that, like, this has allowed for Bitcoin to proliferate from an area to proliferate, for transactions to occur. I think it's by far the least broken, but it's all it's all a spectrum. And I think one, it should be compared to not just the ideal of perfection, and but compared to other alternatives, like other cryptocurrencies and other fiat currencies. And I think uh, there's likely no debate in this room that fiat currencies are broken in the sense that you know, governments have the right uh, and the power at any time to devalue the currency via inflation or seize the asset. Um, but I, I'm going to disagree with Oris uh, and Steve and on proof of stake. Uh, as you've noted, it's been by far way more abused than proof of work, mm -hmm. and it allows those uh, without that much capital to run successful attacks on the network. Um, on a, a podcast we host, we had a, a major miner come on and kind of talk about. Um, you know, basically proof of stake and proof of work and what's gameable and what's not and how even like a centralization of mining isn't really as big of an issue because if, you know, 
miners, even if you had over 51% of miners collude to do double spend on the Bitcoin network now, it would be like ridiculously capital intensive to do and would probably not res result in actually destroying the network. Like it would do the math. They just after, fork away. Or yeah, you just fork away yeah. and it, it would be something like, I think 20 to 30x the market cap of the coin to successfully really like double spend all of it. Uh, so I, I am, you know, optimistic that we will experiment and potentially find other things that are less, uh, require less energy. But I think when you want to prioritize security uh, and like having a ledger that is untainted, I feel like we need to have decades of something else besides proof of work before I'm comfortable doing that for something as important as money. Um, and yeah, I would also say that the energy consumption is a feature, not a bug. Uh, I think it's unfortunate that it does use lots of energy given the kind of energy and climate crisis we're having right now. But um, I would like to look at it holistically where, uh, kind of what I was saying to Amart before, uh, a deflationary currency, I think, does a lot for the environment. And there's, there's like how much energy it uses, but then there's what are its effects on energy as a whole. So big fan of proof of work. Hopefully we can figure out something else that is less gameable than proof of work. Uh, but I'm, I'm not optimistic about that in the next kind of few years. Have you heard about Chia coin? Yeah. Okay. But it, you know, again, it's your good now, right? Yeah, and some would argue, I think, on a fundamental level, is is gameable, like most variations of proof of stake. My question was more about um, why the Harry Potter thing we use. Was it more of a cosmetic thing, or uh, does it have an actual implementation? Uh, no. Okay. Yeah, it was uh, the original white paper was done by uh, Tom Elvis. Juvisaurs. It's it's it's. I I I'm destroying this. I'm just, I'm, I know. I should know the origin. I don't remember. I don't really care. Uh, but it's it was the uh, French name of Tom Riddle, whatever, whatever that is. And uh, they just all started running with Harry Potter names. And uh, uh, there's a there's one of the one of the core developers just like I'm not doing it. I don't care. <laughs> Uh, you guys can all, you know, just, just stop, like, please, like, we're trying to be a professional thing here, so, yeah, um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's just some typical developer humor, yeah. I mean, I, I feel like, like, a lot of these decentralized communities have the type of humor, like, like, developers, like, Yves Plume, um, yeah, he's, he's the one that said, I'm not doing the Harry Potter Oh, thing. he's the one. Yeah. <laughs> he put his foot down, he's like, no. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I like it. I think it's, it's quite entertaining in, in many respects. Yeah. And Mimble Wimble, though, is the hidden spell. Whatever. I, I don't know. Right, Zach, could you describe what happened with the Beam Wallet um, a few weeks back where there was a vulnerability that was exposed? Um, yeah. So, so I, I think, uh, first off, I'm not a developer, so I can't speak to all the technical specifications, but I'll do my best to summarize as I understand the course of events. And I actually think that this is what, you know, the way the Beam team handled this critical vulnerability made me even more confident in kind of the investment in the team and the approach that was taken as a result. As Aura said before, with Zcash, there was a critical vulnerability for a year. Uh, no one saw it. Some people took advantage, like the community didn't see it, but some people took advantage of it. We see forks like Bitcoin Gold, where no one realizes for a few months that there was just like a pre-mine and the founders have an extra like 20% of the total supply. Uh, Beam, like a lot, if not the, like basically all proof of work cryptocurrencies uh, had a vulnerability very early on within like the week after, uh, 10 days after it launched. And then it internally found the issue and fixed it before anyone kind of suffered from the attack. Um, so I don't know exactly what the vulnerability was. I don't have the technical knowledge to, to understand it. But um, yeah, like, I I'd, I'd say also just on top of that, it's that it's actually really common. Uh, Scatter had that problem as well for EOS, and uh, at some point you could just hack anyone Scatter <laughs> and then take all their EOS. So um, I think making a wallet really secure is hard, um, yeah. and it requires a lot of auditing. Um, so. Yeah, at least uh, when the Beam thing got hacked, uh, you know, there wasn't that many people on it. You know, like not like. Well, it, did, it didn't even get hacked. The, the, oh yeah, the, sorry, the they the found the vulnerability. Found and then yeah. Explained. Yeah. The transparency what happened. Yeah. I guess the point of the question, or maybe it's a comment, but when you're launching a new 
uh, cryptocurrency and you're asking users to basically delete the wallet and reinstall it, it's a really hard hurdle to overcome um, when you're asking uh, so much of the user at the beginning where you're trying to create a, a nice user experience. So I just wanted to mention that as something that turned me off about the Beam project early on was me having to kind of basically do over. Um, and curious about the grin implementation, what is the strategy for user adoption or, or creating a better user experience? Yeah, I, I have it in my backpack. Yeah, I'm happy to show you. Yeah. The the the, 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 the Windows graphical okay. wallet. Yeah. yeah. See yeah see, uh, so Steven's building like what's probably going to be the best green wallet at least for a while. So. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we we got lots of cool bells and whistles on it, and uh, we're we're happy to support um, like all kinds of Mimblewimble implementation. Again, I'm not part of the green team. There's no team, um, but. Yeah, we, we, we felt that about three or four months ago, we were like, okay, yeah, we're going to do a grin pool. We're going to build pool software. We're going to build miners and stuff. And then we're like, wait a minute, there's no wallet. <laughs> like, maybe we should focus on this first before uh, we get ourselves carried away and battle the titans, uh, so to speak. So no one's working, no one's really working on a wallet. So we kind of cornered that niche. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, we plan to capitalize on the 2,000 people who have grin. <laughs> I definitely understand how that could be really off-putting, you know, trusting this and then realizing it was a critical vulnerability. But again, there were a significant amount of critical vulnerabilities in early, basically every early Bitcoin wallet and MetaMask and most ETH wallets, the DAO, like every major like project has had like a significant amount of critical vulnerabilities in wallets. Uh, and I, I wish that any good project of substance like Beam wouldn't have that, but I think to expect that there would be zero things like that uh, in its early stage development is just unrealistic of how kind of emerging technology uh, happens. Yeah, and the, um, the uh, productive feedback would be when the critical vulnerability is discovered, make it as easy as possible for the user to make the update or to reinstall as opposed to going through you know, a bunch more steps. Did you read the update regarding why they did that? I, I haven't touched Beam since since that happened, but I'll go back and I'll take So the reason they did that is because they wanted to be absolutely sore about the security of it. So they could have done that like a lot of other wallets like MetaMask did and then realized that they actually left a critical vulnerability for a certain percentage, but they wanted to prioritize security over kind of the user experience in that, yeah. in that case. And it's leading edge too, so I'm going in expecting things to break. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the session. It's amazing. Uh, and what are the, the main use cases of, of uh, Beam at this stage? Because I like uh, a, a lot of talks about technology in San Francisco and Silicon Valley, but then I like to see, uh, okay, what's the, uh, like, who is using it really? Because I know that Zcoin, we talk about Monero, Monero is a lot for illegal stuff. Zcash has some like uh, corporate uh, use cases. Yeah. Zcoin has been used for like the uh, time and election. Yeah. And that's, a, that's actually a proper use case. What's all that hype about uh, the team? Like, what, what's it used for? Great, great question, and, I, and I'm going to give kind of like a similar answer that I did to you, which is like, Beam is five to six weeks old. Yeah. So they're 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 working right. on they're working on being used by corporates. They're you know early on, two months before it launched, they contacted all their investors, including us, being like, Hey, can you introduce us to your fund administrators and auditors? We want to know what the major admins and auditors are doing in the financial centers in the U.S. and Hong Kong and London. Is we want to make it so that those that use Beam and want to have privacy. Uh, full privacy can do so, but that also that corporate, large corporations can be able to opt in for full audibility and regular compliance. So the, the, the direct answer to your question is like right now it's more like crypto enthusiasts and speculators that are using it, uh, like basically every new project, but I think that's kind of just how technology emerges and develops. You have you know early adopters, enthusiasts, and speculators, and then you kind of, you know, there's that famous different curves, and I forget all the different names on them, but at the beginning, you have the early adopters and speculators, and I, I don't think that's like a, a bad thing. I think that's like a feature because if it wasn't for the early adopters and the speculators and the investors, you'd have this technology adopted and developed much slower. Okay, so for, for the moment, nobody is using it. People are using it, but the primary users of it are, are speculators and crypto. Yeah, I mean, like in the real world. Right? Yes, no. After five or six weeks, it is not being okay. substantially used for uh, transactions. Yeah. I, I'd have to say that the curve that you're talking about is. Uh, it's actually from 1956. I, I'm just gonna be such a nerd right now, but it's actually talking about uh, adoption of farm equipment. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm dead serious. And then they, and then they changed their well, then action. somebody brought it up in some 1980s book, and then it's just been repeated over and over again of like, oh yeah, you got the innovators, and then you got the early adopters, and yeah, then you yeah. got the trendsetters. <laughs> it's actually about farm equipment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's funny because you talk about the initial speculators and the adopters, but then as an entrepreneur, when you go to like uh, investors, they talk to you, okay, who are your users, where is your platform, and who is it being used by? Sure. So this is contradictory. Uh, I think, generally speaking, I understand where you're coming from, but I think when it comes to like money specifically, it's different than building like a platform or an app or a business and then trying to get users for that business. Like trying to get people to use money, that's like a very different like problem and yeah. process than, than other things. So I, so I think you actually want speculators early on because that's what's going to give the greatest chance to have adoption over the long term of non-speculators. Yeah, I mean, hype is important. Hype and capital, yeah. yeah, yeah. Has anybody read the book Ream D by yes. Stevenson? Yes. This guy. Awesome. Perfect. So the book, it's, it's funny because the book, and going back to your sec the, your previous work history with um, secondary markets for, yeah. for gaming assets, uh, but maybe Grin's killer app is laundering money via yeah. selling these secondary, or, I mean laundering, that, that's what the book uh -huh. talks about, is this uh, very... We call it remittance, sir. Remittance, right? <laughs> um, but being maybe that capital outflow mechanism um, that you know when when the crash does hit and you need to find the safe haven because the fiat has totally you know okay I you're just opening a can of worms with sure. me right now so um, <clears throat> yeah have you guys uh, heard about Venezuela <laughs> and local bitcoins and uh, yeah yeah I've been looking at that for about a, about a month and a half now. Uh, actually, you can pull the API information from local bitcoins and actually see that this like curve was happening. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's quite interesting that uh, actually the, the one of the number one adopted coins in Venezuela is I mean of course Bitcoin, but it's actually Dash. Yeah. Yeah, and because they've been doing they've been pumping a crap load of marketing there, <laughs> and everyone's kind of like land grabbing Venezuela while it's like you know about to erupt into a civil war. So um, yeah, um, when you can't trust your central government to bank. That's when cryptocurrencies are going to take off because they don't know what else to do at that point. And then uh, another great thing about Venezuela is it's free electricity, right? So, you know, free electricity? Electricity. Oh, free electricity, it's basically subsidized by the government to provide almost free electricity if you can, if the power stays on for more than four days. Uh, and also if you can figure out how to get a computer that has like a graphic card that's uh, worth mining with. Um, but if you have all that, then you can feed your family. I, I think somebody was running a Reddit campaign where they just donated like, 10 bucks to like a few families and things like that and that like fed that family for a week they're like i don't know what i would have done without this it was uh yeah. i don't know if they gave like doge coin or something i don't know it was like some <laughs> just some afterthought of some some guy on like a like a mountain do high he just like yeah. decided to give some money to venezuela but yeah is doge the chinese word for doge is it doge yeah i don't know yeah. <laughs> doge. <laughs> I, I, well doge is from japan okay right? yeah, yeah. So, so, so speaking of both of your guys' points about like the killer app for the nimble and lower these types of money, I think the killer app is it's for those that are have the highest risk of seizure and the highest risk of inflation. So I think Venezuela is like everyone's talking about it. It's the prime example. I think there's other countries where inflation and asset seizure is like a big risk. But you know, while Beam is already before it launched, thinking about like how corporates in the U.S. will adopt. Corporates in the U.S. will be literally the last adopters of so much of this technology, and that's good. You know, like when it comes to money specifically, I think that it needs to be, go to those in which it's such an improvement over the status quo. And for those that are financially secure in countries where asset seizure is the probability is very low, like here in the U.S., uh, Beam, Grin, Nibble, Wimble, Bitcoin matters a lot less, and it's more, you know, it's more speculators than not than it does to people in Argentina, Angola. In Venezuela, where you know generations of you know financial insecurity, of inflation, of currencies being completely demise. So that's where I'm excited about uh, both store place, things to store value, like a beam, or even stable coins like Reserve. That is unlike other stable coins, targeting you know those that are have those types of risks as opposed to just kind of crypto traders. I'm just going to bring up one weird story. Uh, Back in Brazil, there was a video game called Gunbound, and uh, basically, people knew who the number one player was, and they kidnapped him uh, because his account was super valuable. Uh, he was the number one player in Gunbound in the world, 
uh, his account name was probably valued around like 500,000 US, which is a lot of money out there. And they pointed a gun to his face and they said, give me your password. And he said, no, I'd rather die. And they didn't know what to do, so they let him go. However, you know, with Bitcoin, uh, I can see that case happening even more aggressively. And, uh, you know, if, uh, if somebody can actually trace your address down to who you are, uh, you're screwed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which is why I believe that privacy is so important, uh, especially in emerging co countries like that, uh, where your your security might be at risk if, if people actually know who you are and how much you have in your wallet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so going back to like the vulnerability issue from a developer's perspective, I think it's impossible to ever not have a stop it but the, the problem is with crypto is that those vulnerabilities get scaled, right? So well, what are some of the systematic safeguards that we really provide sufficient path to control the last one? Could you, could you be more specific? <laughs> you mean how to stop all vulnerabilities in crypto or? So, I, I feel like we need some kind of framework. So like the, the thing is, uh, vulnerability in crypto is not like printing out fake bills from your uh, garage and like, smuggling in, right? The, the damage is, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so it depends on, on the type of vulnerability. So being able to steal something from someone's wallet is very different than being able to, you know, pre-mine in secret, like the supply. Like there's there's different issues. But I think the short answer is that there's no there's no good, you know, short answer I can give you of like how to stop a lot of these types of vulnerabilities. But I think the best thing to do because of that is to be anti-fragile and focus on security and focus on solving like the biggest problems with the utmost of security. The way that like a Bitcoin, or I think the way Beam is approaching this, um, and I would say allocating a significant amount of funds to the top security auditors, which again, something like Beam has done, and that's what they have prioritized, despite missing that vulnerability in the first week. I think that's really the only thing you do is just put the top talent and capital towards trying to solve that until being able to have a good answer for a lot of these problems is known. But as most people know here, I think we're very early on in terms of cryptocurrency and blockchain technology adoption. So there's inherently going to be lots of vulnerabilities and lots of projects. And then I was talking to a Bitcoin core developer a couple of weeks ago, and he said the problem with a lot of security audits is all the dependencies. So he, he sort of described it to me like a, usually a project is kind of like a tree on what it's dependent on. And it's how far down along the tree do they go. So it's like whether you, you find a, a vulnerability in Grin like at the top of the chain versus finding some, some vulnerability way at the bottom that affects hundreds of other currencies. I mean, that's the, the real issue. It's how, how deep do we really want security audits to go, which is very capital extensive and time extensive. And, uh, Grin, I think, has over 50 dependencies. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's why they were raising 75K for that, uh, that audit, which uh, they barely made. <laughs> Other question. So, like Aris, you were talking about proof of stake, but you like proof of stake. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, first of all, there is like the security question. But then, like, when you think about crypto, a lot of the ideas behind it is like to make a more distributed economic system. But then, the proof of stake actually, uh, and, like, make has the same patterns on the current economic systems. But actually, exacerbate it. Uh, so, how do you deal with that? I think like like I think EOS does this is that every for an X amount of time period, the the block producers change. Yeah. So it, it, it allows for different people to come into power. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, I mean, right now it's been historically like people who are friends with people higher up. Uh, but I think in an, an ide ideal world, it, it would be really like the, the, there would be small communities that band behind certain block producers that would become the representatives and then new communities form that, that gain, gain more traction or whatnot. So it's kind of like there, there, there are like little states or countries that each, each send the representative in. Which I think is interesting, but I, I mean, it's it's totally up up in the air for the future to see. And, and EOS isn't trying to prioritize security the way that Bitcoin is or the way that other smart contract uh, platforms are, DAO platforms are, and they've made that public. And I think you know we'll see like which developers and which applications are built on top of those. But those that care about censorship resistant resistance, I don't think will, and they they're they're comfortable with that. Okay, thanks. I have a question. Uh, so earlier you guys mentioned the different kinds of consensus. Have you guys heard of the proof of capacity, like the from chain network? Mm -hmm. 
um, the proof of capacity. So I'm, I'm just curious about uh, knowing like your viewpoint on proof of capacity because it's like a combination of POW yeah. and POS. So I all I want to say is that I looked into Chia uh -huh. uh, when the opportunity came about six months ago. Yeah, it's about, they're building a uh, public public chain. Yeah, and that. my understanding when I did my due diligence then was that it suffers from a lot of the kind of gameability issues that proof of stake does. But I can't speak to it like specifically, and I would love if you know Ryan from Chia or someone who knew more about it, or if you want to educate us on how it works because uh, it, it struck me as like fairly complex and. Generally, with like complex systems, especially new ones, there's a lot more room for vulnerabilities and attack vectors than with kind of more simple things like a Bitcoin. Mm, the part that I've learned is because basically it combines the so basically it you utilize the space for the from disks. So capacity is like you have as long as you have rooms on your disks, you can start to mine for point uh, the the coins. So in a way, it's becoming a lot more energy efficient. And also, it's still utilizing the like mining algorithm, so it's still like better than POS. Does it, it use equal hash? Work based on proof of work. Yeah, yeah, hash. Yeah, it still has the hash block part. So, yeah. so that's what I've learned. That basically combines the pros and the pros from both uh, consensus. So I was just trying to understand if you guys, how you guys think of. Well, yeah, it was brought up twice now tonight, so I'll definitely look into it again. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I've, like, Awesome Ventures is an investor in Filecoin, so I mean, I've explored... Oh, similar to Filecoin concept. Yeah. So I've explored, like, Filecoin, SiaCoin, a lot of the storage ones. Okay. Uh, Chia coin I haven't gone th that deep into, but I'm pretty sure Bram Cohen is behind it, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. Mr. BitTorrent. Yeah. yeah the so, I mean, yeah, I'm personally a fan of him, so I, <laughs> <laughs> so I think it, it's definitely an interesting project, but I don't have a strong opinion on the consensus. Because around the same time that um, uh, in China, like, we did a project that we kind of forced Bitcoin, but based on proof of capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had about like 100 mi miners mining for that coin. So we call it balance coin because we think it's a balance of PO, W, and PO. So, and then but then it kind of stopped because we didn't get a good on exchanges. And also Bittorin came up, so we were like, oh, okay, we'll just pause that project. Yeah. yeah. It, has Filecoin been released? No, so Filecoin, the testnet should go up within the next couple quarters and hopefully main up by the end of the year. Thank you all for coming tonight. We'll give you the support. Every second Wednesday, we're going to do something like this with a little music and then a little crypto talk on a timely topic. Uh, I'm here. I have my cards here. If there's anything you want to be discussed for the next month or just want to talk, I'm here for a little bit. Thanks so much for coming. Thank hey, thanks so much for the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I was at the birthday event. Yeah. Yeah, this is where Tiwan Thanks. Uh, that was great. Yeah. Your name? Uh, yeah. Nice to meet you. Yeah, exactly. I got to talk to David. Oh, nice. 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 O